Okay. So, uh, what we see today is on um, serverless in Java journey is just a quick intro about what you do. So, I'm an uh, active open source contributor to OpenDisk, uh, Eclipse J, and Fabricate platform. So, I've also had the great robotics plan and plug it. So, uh, if you guys want to reach out to me, uh, here are my social handles, which, which can be uh, where I can do this stuff. So what we do today is um, Java serverless journey. So what I want to show you today is like how do we deploy the Java applications on serverless platform like OpenDisk. Uh, so we can find the, the complete uh, the URL where we can see this demo. It's a step-by-step -step instruction on how we do this demo. So in case if we run fast, then probably you can just use that to do a service-based learning. So this is what uh, definition from Martin Fowler's stuff. So how do we define serverless? So uh, serverless technically doesn't mean that there is no servers. So we do have servers, uh, but they come and go down whenever you need it. It's not that it's going to be live, always running. Okay. Uh, so this is highly efficient because this model has been just started to mature now. It's not very efficient or very popular right now, but people are starting to adapt it. And they found it really efficient when you have your applications running in cloud, uh, because that's where uh, you start to see your cost saving and other stuff which comes in the future. Right. So, what is Apache OpenDisk? Uh, I think probably if people have known about IBM Functions, uh, then Apache OpenDisk is the open source variant of IBM Functions. So, they technically IBM open source this to Apache, and it's right now in Apache Incubator. And you can have functions written in JavaScript, Swift, Java, Python, PHP, Docker, Go for now. So it could be, uh, and then it can be deployable on any cloud platform. So you can deploy it on AWS, or you can deploy it on your own cloud platform. You'll see how we do that in OpenShift today, uh, in Kubernetes platform. Okay. So these are some theory uh, about few terms which you keep listening across when you start to listen about serverless. I think irrespective of whether it's Java or JavaScript or Node or Python, it doesn't matter. Uh, so actions, uh, these are the core uh, thing which runs on a function. Basically, actions are kind of a heart of any serverless platform. So whenever you do something, the action is getting invoked and it's called a status. But there is no state to it actually. And then package, again, is a logical bundling of your application. Um, and then we can have a bunch of functions together in the group, and then we can have visibility of the packages as well. Feeds, uh, this is another critical thing uh, in any serverless world because uh, serverless functions, since we told that it's going to be come up and go down, so there should be something which should feed an action to the function. We need to say, like, I feed something inside and the function gets invoked. For example, let's say uh, we use Slack uh, or any kind of an IM, IRC. Then somebody types something on IRC and then that I read that word and then that serves as an event source to my function and my function gets invoked and then it does some processing of it again. Right. And triggers uh, are nothing but again uh, feed works closely with feeds. Um, it says like so I tie it's kind of a uh, tying twain between your action and your uh, feeds. Let's say for this feed, uh, this trigger will be triggered, which will trigger this particular action, right? Um, so at times, like it's, it, these three terms are pretty bit, bit confusing, uh, but you have to read multiple times to get understood. About rules, um, rules are nothing but like uh, it's again uh, how do I tie my trigger to an action, right? So I get trigger, I have feeds. So how do I tie my trigger to an action? You need to say that when I trigger something, some action has to be invoked, right? So that's that's where we define rule. Rules could be enabled and disabled. Sometimes if we want to disable some rule, I can go and disable the rule, re enable it. Uh, activation uh, is nothing but your logs uh, of how many how the function was invoked, what's the output of the function, in any errors there. So all these things gets gets come from of your activation of the function. Okay. All right. So uh, what are the invocation patterns we have right now? So uh, we have three main invocation patterns. Uh, one is asynchronous. Technically, all functions tend to be asynchronous. Means they are fire and forget. Uh, I don't know what happened. I have to go back and visit my activation log to see what exactly happens. Um, and synchronous, I mean to say, I wait for that. So, the response to a typical web kind of interface where I wait 
for the response to come uh, after you invoke a function. Uh, scheduled is something like your cron jobs, which gets executed in a specified interval of time. So these are the right of the three main uh, invocation pattern around functions. So how does uh, OpenVisc work? Right? Uh, so OpenVisc has uh, these many components, for example, an Nginx uh, front-end, so which serves as a REST interface. And then we have a controller, uh, it's a technically which controls everything inside your uh, application. So, and then we have a Kafka engine running, so which schedules the messages to get the action gets invoked. Uh, and we have the Couch TV, uh, which serves as a place where it controls your authentication information, action information, all these things are stored inside the Couch TV. Can, technically, you can imagine like it's the database repository for your uh, OpenVisc thing. And then invokers, uh, invokers are nothing but um, a Docker engine. Um, so each node will have one invoker. Uh, each invoker is a Docker container. So for example, for each type of functions we saw, right, for Java, JavaScript, Node.js, Python, Go. So we have one invoker for each type of functions and then this invoker takes care of triggering or starting a new container, a Docker container, which runs your code and then comes out. So, so each node will have one invoker. So this is the very high level view of how OpenVisc works. Okay, let's quickly see, uh, write some quick functions. Uh, just to get a feel of it. So as I told you, like uh, you can go to this place. So uh, I have a complete tutorial done. Done though it says as Java fast tutorial, but I have uh, basic basic examples of thing how running. So I'm a Java guy, so kind of wrote Java functions. So you can write in any language you wish. So uh, so what I'm going to do quickly is um, so just go to do this function. Uh, First, let me see if I have the function. So the very basic command is this uh, dash i action list. So this gives you uh, the list of actions that is already there. We're using a different instance yesterday, so my Docker be my response is somewhere else. Sitting environment is I just changed this from my talk yesterday, so I'm just updating it once more. Okay. Alright, so I just have one action, it's good. So, um, so usually, um, so what I've done is like uh, you see, I see, so this is an HTTP as you order, so. Technically, when you run WISC for the first time, uh, so what happens is that you'll get an unauthenticated certificate errors. So usually to avoid that, since it's my local environment, we need to uh, append a parameter called as dash i. So it's dash dash insecure kind of stuff. So what I did is like I just made an alias for WISC by always using to use dash i. So I don't need to type it every time. Okay. So let's quickly go uh, and then write our first function. Um, I just make this, I just following this for the like just make sure and I'm just going to write a very simple function. Um, and that's that's all I need. 
So I just go there and then say create this action. And you see your action is heading you. Is that clear? Okay. So what I did is like uh, I went and created an action. If you see, it's not a big uh, file. I just said a simple JSON response that is given from this uh, function, basically. So uh, I just created the action and then I say, okay, create this action, and you saw that this action was created for the creator. Right. Let's verify if it's there. List action list. So I see that this by default is a JS. Uh, it gets attached to a Node.js runtime by default. Um, and then it's by default the default package is list system. So if you want to create a package, then I can attach a package act into the package. Okay. So how do I invoke? It's pretty, it's pretty simple to invoke. So this is the synchronous model, which I said. So which means that I have to wait for the response to come. Since it's a very simple function, I say, give me the response with dash dash result, which means that I'll, the, the, the command will wait for the response to come. This is a synchronous mode of invocation. So there you go. So you get you get a response here. In case if I don't read, so the asynchronous mode is like this. I do this. Once I do this, I get an invocation ID. So and then I have to say risk activation. I said activation is the uh, the log for all your things. Activation uh, result, and then I say the activation ID. Once I say this, I pretty much get the same response. There is also a way by which I can do this risk activation code. So it's a long running thing like for usually for a developer environment you can just have it polling. So that whenever a new action gets invocated you see the logs on the pole. Okay. So if for example let's say risk action, let me copy this without And then I say invoke this action. And you'll see this, this action got invoked here. Okay. And then it gives you an activation ID, and then you can just start it. Okay. So these are pretty uh, uh, useful stuff. So this, this is two different models. I have not have any, I don't have an example for scheduled one, but this is how we invoke a, a asynchronous and synchronous model in this okay. so Let's get back to uh, what we have here. Okay. So, what are Java actions? Um, Java actions are nothing, uh, it's a pretty again uh, same similar action as how we wrote in JavaScript, but it's a traditional Java language, a single class usually in Java server, and then it has a different signature for the main method. So we use a JSON object input and JSON object output as a parameter. It's a, it's a rule for writing a Java function on uh, OpenDisk. Okay. Uh, so I did a bit of uh, search around two main components, like we have something called a Spring Cloud functions. Uh, which are the same word, and then the plain old function, right? The simple Java function, right? So, so the advantages of what I found was like the plain old Java functions were simple Java code, simple class, and then I have a bunch of methods which I write, um, and it's very simple and straightforward to understand. Uh, the only problem is that I found was it's not portable across uh, serverless providers. For example, I have to take open this thing and then go and deploy it on AWS Lambda or Azure function, right? It's not portable. Uh, and then the dependencies needs to be bundled together. For example, if my function depends upon, let's say, three ports or comments lang or comments uh, logging or something like that, then those have to be bundled along. Uh, that's that makes your jar a little bit uh, yeah, right. Right now, uh, if I remember correctly, that the maximum size of an open list uh, jar is 50 MB, so I cannot have more than that. Right. Um, and then, um, so right now it uses third-party Google JSON for open this Java action, which means that I'll show an example right now. My method signature has to use uh, the JSON object, uh, Google JSON library for, for the input and output, right, to convert the JSON object. So we uh, at Red Hat, so we are working towards uh, making, defining the Java model. So we are kind of saying that how the Java function should be there for open this. Uh, so on the on the contrary, uh, I tried Spring Cloud functions also deploying on on, on uh, Open Risk, uh, and then there are quite a good advantages things here like um, it's popular Spring programming model for you, and then it gives you uses supplies and consumers the, the typical Java eight uh, language constructs. Right? So it, it identifies them if you annotate them as Spring beans, then it takes them as functions and deploys them, 
um, and then it has adapters for OpenWiz, KWS, Azure, uh, all this stuff so it's easy for you to port across. Uh, but there are big disadvantages because I found it really heavy uh, for a function in normal because I don't need so many sprint dependencies that come here. Right? Uh, and then I'll also like the startup time is longer, uh, function should be super fast coming up and down. Uh, but because of these dependencies, what's happening is that uh, it has to wire those dependencies, get those dependencies inside your application when doing the runtime. So, which is causing it to be very slow. Um, and then it uses some kind of thin jar for dependency resolution that we talked about. Um, customization is not possible uh, because um, see, right now it's open with, I can deploy my own Java runtime, Docker based runtime, and then deploy it there. Uh, but with, if you, for example, if you take Azure, uh, I cannot deploy my own uh, Docker image there. So I have to use what Docker image made and this is the same thing with uh, Azure as well. Right. So that's that's pretty much a bit of a con uh, because for Spring Cloud functions, I have to build my own Docker image and then deploy the Docker image as your runtime. Okay. So tooling. Um, so there are WISC, which we already saw, it's a default command line interface that we get with Apache OpenWISC, uh, which is used for doing all sort of uh, interaction with the uh, WISC runtime, OpenWISC runtime. WISC deploy uh, is something which they are building right now, so which, which, which helps you define your function deployment as a YAML file, like how we do for a Kubernetes YAML, um, and then we can just deploy the function. You can define packages names, and then function names, main class, and all these stuff. It's a YAML manifest, and then it will take the manifest and deploy it. Okay. Uh, Maven for Java, so I just pushed one Maven uh, archetype and the Maven tooling sample for Java. So you can just use Maven archetype, that's what we'll be using in our example in a few minutes. So this can be used for Java alone uh, to deploy the thing. Um, and then for serverless framework, uh, uh, there's a framework for the company of you heard of serverless.com. So it's a, an exclusively serverless framework, uh, so which uses, which, which is portable, which has framework or templates for multiple providers, as you, AWS, IBM functions and open risk, right? It is based on Node.js, uh, it gives you templates to create and then it also has a YAML manifest where you need to fill in some details and you can do deploy across uh, multiple uh, providers easily. Okay. Uh, so we also pushed here, so it did not have a open with Java uh, template, uh, serverless.com and we pushed from the we pushed for that as well. So now serverless framework also supports openwiz java as well. So you can that template as well. So um, quickly on web action, so this is the most first thing which any developer would like to do. So even if I uh, deploy a java function or javascript function or any kind of a function, I want to know how do I invoke via web. Meaning to say I have an HTTP URL and I use any kind of uh, HTTP REST verb like get post, put tell, anything I want and then I want to get it invoked. Um, so for example, what it says is like, so it has an URL and then I can also have the content type for your virtue of prefixing the URL. Let's say dot JSON then means my content type will be uh, JSON, application slash JSON. If I do dot HTML, then it means that it's one. I'm going to get an HTML that's one from the function. Um, and then I can have query parameters, I can have request body, as you should with any, any function. So what happens is naturally the request body and query parameters will be landing as function parameters. Um, and I have a content type data I said now, and then it's not, <coughs> it's not what you call it, I think it's a typo there, uh, it's not asynchronous I mean to say, so which means that I have, my result has to be blocked until my response is not back. Um, so sometimes some resources need authentication, uh, not all functions are open, if a function is private package, then I need authentication for it as well. So let's quickly check this. So what I mean by parameters is that uh, if you've seen my old uh, the example which you wrote just a few minutes ago. Uh, so I this this method doesn't have any parameters. So usually technically what I can do is like I can just say like this. Um, so this params will be a JSON input to a function. Right? Whatever keypads you can give, you can just give keypads and you can just pass them as parameters as well. We see that in example in a moment. So, okay, I'm going shifting back to my notes, the tutorial which I wrote. So, so what I'm going to do is like I said, I we need this, so right now this uh, 
this Java action archetype, uh, which is a Maven archetype, which is not there in Maven Central. So, uh, is clear? No. So, so what I have to do is like I have to install it locally. I already have it locally, so I'm not going to do that step. So, what I'm going to do is like uh, I'm going to create the Java project now. So, I just say this. Just copy and paste this. So I say Maven archetype generate. Uh, this particular artifact and then example I'll show you open up the sources in a few seconds. So I just go to create an artifact called as open list. Okay. So we are just working out with open list guys to see this archetype is pushed to Maven Central so that you don't need to install it locally. So it's already available like any other Maven archetype. So it's just taking the stuff here. Just go ahead and give the defaults and ask for something so there's no need to update that. Just go and give the defaults. Okay. So if you see this, uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, as I told you earlier, uh, this has one dependency. Um, so this has this Google JSON dependency which is required because right now open this mandates that we have to use the classes from JSON for JSON conversions. So I have to do this and all of the stuff if you see I have used Maven Shade plugin um, to kind of make an Uber jar with all my dependencies bundled inside one single jar uh, and that's pretty much what it has from form perspective. So if you go to your class a very simple class here for this for this sake. So as I told earlier, so uh, this is this is not a typical uh, Java main main function. So this function is a little bit different. If you see it as a JSON object as a return type, and then it takes a JSON object as arguments. So which means that I, I can pass a JSON or any argument that you pass via this CLI will be converted into JSON and given to it. So, uh, so you don't need to worry about it. All I have to do is like which I have to know which object, which attribute I think extract inside my class. Okay. So in this example, I'm not doing anything very serious here. I just take the JSON object and then I say append a response and then it's the JSON path. Okay. So let's go build this and deploy. So what I have to do is like just do this clean package. <laughs> so you're good. And then to deploy is, is awesomely so easy. Uh, I'll explain these parameters in a second. Uh, let's see. So I say that I create a new action called as hello open list, uh, which will have which will take the jar as an input. Uh, and then the main class I have to tell you which main class I have to go and call for this function invocation. And I can have multiple classes inside my jar. Uh, I can say which main class I have to invoke. So Again, there is a there is again uh, another thing which I am working on to see that it can automatically infer this parameter from manifest file, jar manifest, which is which is still in work in progress. So, let's start it. Okay, uh, I have to just change this one. It immediately go. There was a glitch with my archetype, so I have to use this one as artifact um, ID. Uh, it's, it's just a pojo, that's it. So, so you can have any number of pojo. If you see this, this is a function class. Uh, if you see, uh, it's just a it's just a pojo. I don't have anything else inside this, right? I can invoke, I can even add dependencies and invoke any other stuff like this. Even if you see the, the small text class which I written here, so I just do a simple invocation like this. That's all. So like how it is going. So I built a JSON object response. So here I'm building it manually. So if you use this CLI, this with CLI automatically builds those JSON objects based on the parameters. So for each parameter you pass, everything will be a JSON object. So I've rebuilt it. So my private job. 
and then he, there you go. So you get the action created. So how do we verify it? Risk action list. And then since I gave it that jar, uh, Wisp will automatically attach a Java runtime to this. So that's what you see here. Java. The previous one we did was no change. Right. Um, but what you are seeing about right now is that we are talking about doing a web action. So what I have to technically do for a web action is that it's very simple. So I say web equals to another command which you are going to learn now. So right now I have a, let us invoke it first and then we will go back to it later, converting that into web action. Uh, so what I am going to do is like I am going to invoke synchronously, I just say this result. And you get a response from your, uh, uh, how do I convert, so there is a risk, as I told this create, there is also something called a risk update. Uh, what I mean by this is that, let's say I want to update a function. Let's say I already deployed it. I want to use the same name, but a different artifact has to go, different main function has to go. I just say update. So once I do this, this, this function now I have attached an attribute called as web equal to true, which means that this is now converted into a web function. Right? So uh, what I can do right now is like this: um, I action get the action name and then if I say dash dash url I will get a HTTP url here for this function right so how do I can also do this as well um, summary right it gives a summary of uh, my function as well so these are uh, I have used multiple commands here first one is that the update command which means that I am going and updating back the function Let's say I changed my logic of the function. I already have created the function the same length. I just want to go and update it, right? In this case, what I try to do is like I'm uh, annotating that with an extra parameter called as web equal to true, which means that my action has now become a web action, which means that I get an HTTP URL to invoke. Uh, I can use it irrespective of it can use any method. There is no method attachment here, which means that it's it's just an URL. I can use get, post, delete any kind of method. It's not just you can use only get, I cannot use only report. But there are ways by which I can restrict it, but here in this case it's not restricted. Um, this action get summary, which gives you a summary of your functions. Let's say if I have defined multiple parameters, then my parameters would be like this. See there are some ways um, in openness what we do is like we, we define the parameters, uh, default parameters. We mean to say like, okay, I, let's say I give a name, let's say an example, the function takes a name, and I say by default name should always be sent also. Okay. So I can just define that if even if the user doesn't pass it, the sent also is a parameter that should be taken inside. Right? So how do I invoke this? Is the invocation is from yeah. There's a I mean the parameter to the Java method is just created right. so this one? No, that's that's a standard signature, right? This parameter is defaults within that. Let's say for example I can also have this like a string object. Okay. okay. But it won't show it. It won't show These are these this this what's shown here is is a default parameter. Okay. What if if I don't pass this args, what will be by default? Right. Okay. There'll be cases where, for example, let's let's simply I'm just changing it for a namesake. Let's say I have string name, right? And then what if and then I want to use a name here. What if if I don't pa pass this parameter name, what will happen? the value of it. Right? So that I can define when I create a function I can say a parameter default value and then I say this is the value. And automatically if I don't pass the value it takes that value for the function. Okay. Alright, so how do I invoke this? Um, use our code. I don't get, uh, I cannot see the response right here. Uh, I have to go and invoke it from, uh, I have to say what content time I am expecting it. So I'll say fh. It's another way. Okay. So if you don't specify a content, see the last time I invoked, 
I did not specify a content type, so which means that my response doesn't know how to return a response to me. So the next time I, I invoke, I, I can say that I need JSON content type. When I prefix JSON dot XML or whatever you want to do, when you do that, it returns automatic uh, response in JSON form. So which is obviously my function is a JSON function, so it's JSON payload back. So that's the reason why I prefix this. So in other ways, like you can also pass as a header. Um, as you requested or saying that the content type is application slash JSON, then automatically you get a JSON response back. Okay. So uh, another super critical stuff which you do always is um, when I say this action I use is here. So, so this is highly useful when you debug it. Let me take an invoke. Uh, And if I prefix the verb dash b, the parameter, so what you see here is that you will see the complete uh, request that happens, right? This is highly useful uh, in many times because you will be lost seeing like why my action is not returning something, or why this is not working. In those cases, it's highly useful that I prefix dash b so that you get the complete JSON output and you can find out what's wrong with that. It gives you the authorization that gets in and then what's your response code, what's your response headers, user agent. So you get all these details which gets passed and what's the content type by default and then set some cookie. I don't know for what the cookies have been set for and then it also gives you an activation ID end of the day. That's a response. The response body is received with an activation ID so which means that I can go and look for the logs. Okay. Uh, so for example if I go Take this activation ID and then say this activation result. Then I get the result back. Okay. So any any question on uh, action? Good action. So let's get back to what you're talking about here. So we can also chain actions, um, which means that I can have a series of actions to be called in a sequence. Uh, I can say, okay, call action A, action B, action C, and action D. So I can also have these actions to be chained. Uh, there's also a way by which there's also a runtime. So sequence is, is nothing like I have to define it when I define the action, which means that it is static. So I can also have to say action one, action two, and action three, it's static. Whereas in conductors, it's a different type of sequence where your runtime decides which sequence I need to follow. Right? So this is more dynamic in nature. Uh, so there is no input to the sequence, only the first action takes input. Uh, for all other subsequent actions, the output of the first action serves as an input for the other. Okay? So just like uh, your uh, functions. So let's quickly <coughs> see this also, training as well. So go back to my training example. This is get action. So what you're going to do is that we're going to create three packages. I, what I'll do for, for sake of time, I already have them with me. deploy three actions now so uh, action bonus it's for the sequence demo so I won't go to so I have three actions that basically one one is a sorter and one is a splitter and one is not a case so what I basically do is like is pass a comma separate string as a parameter 
So it goes in the splitter, it splits it down into small chunks of strings and pass it to the upper case which converts that to upper case and then finally it gives to the sorter. So this is a sequence which I'm going to see now. Uh, so let's go, let's go to go back to my thing. So I'll just see, I'll just go and create. So this is a way, uh, this is something new I'm introducing here is how do I create a package. Uh, So what I'm going to do now is just create a package. So package is nothing but logical grouping of your functions. Nothing, no big deal is done here. If you want to hide, encapsulate something, you don't want that to be visible temporarily. So if you do then, if I do list, same thing, if I package list, you'll see the package here. So right now it's private by default. So I can also change it to public as well, right? so that everybody knows it. So now I'm going to do is like I already have this splitter uh, function written. So I'm not going to recreate it again. I'm just going to go build it and deploy it. So I'm just going to go to my splitter function and then I just keep the test for time sake. So my function is ready. So I'm going to go deploy it here. If my function is updated, then I do the same thing for uppercase. Package it. I'm not going to use any. So if you see the difference between the earlier action creation and this action creation is that, so we always suffix this with the package name, see here, which means that it gets into that package. So if I do the same package list here, Says here, so and then if you say action list, you will see that action is getting inside a package. Right? So, this system that had developers demo and slash builder or slash reader, so it gets into that way. Okay? So, I'm going to create the uppercase function. This is also done. Then I go to the sort action and then I do a build. I just create the sort action as well. Alright, so we're good now. So to create a sequence, uh, what I basically do is like I create a sequence action. It's again a simple action thing. I just want to just be here. I say I create action uh, update with split upper sort. I just rename it like this. And if you see, I'm adding a sequence parameter to this. The sequence parameter I say comma separate a list of functions that they need to be invoked. It typically follows the same order in which you give it. In this case, I'm going to go to splitter, and then after splitter it goes to uppercase. After uppercase, it's going to go to the sort. Okay. So my action is created. So once my action is created, all you have to do is like let's invoke it. See what <coughs> happens? So if you see here, I'm just passing a param text. That's what I use inside. So after param, the first parameter after param is a name of the parameter, which technically if you see that, that gets as a JSON attribute. So when I'm getting it out, I have to use the name text to get the attribute value. And then I'm just passing a comma separator of string to be sorted. And then I'm going to expect the response now. So this is the first time usually it takes a bit of time for the Java, the next time it gets sorted. Now if you see, I get a result which is sorted now. So which means here, there's a three sequence of actions getting called. Uh, to snow, let's do one thing. So let's quickly activation four. <coughs> so I just going to do an activation poll to see the sequence of actions get the work. But if you see, if you see the activation poll. Uh, I get the splitter first, and then your uppercase is called, and then your sorter is called. So it's the sequence which we define that I have to go in this sequence. That's how it's being done here as well. And then I get the, for this finally the sort, split sorter action class, that is kind of collating the response from these three things and giving to you. Okay? 
So that's about uh, chaining. So it also has, I think we saw about uh, in the jargons, in the theory uh, slide where we said like there's an event driven capabilities of open risk, which means that somebody can invoke some event and then the result of the event will be a trigger that cause an action, right? So that's what we do here. So uh, the events could be another function, external event kind of feed provider right now. Uh, it supports GitHub, uh, Slack, uh, and all. Even you can write your own provider as well, which sends an event. So we wrote we wrote one <coughs> provider for uh, InfiniSpan cache. So where we said that any entry you put on InfiniSpan cache, so that gets the event gets triggered via the InfiniSpan listener. The listener will then call a trigger to trigger an event, and then to give it to any function that has some action on it. Right. So we did we did that way. So rules. Event action in openness is that invokes a trigger. Again, I said that rules ties actions to triggers. Um, and the trigger, there are three types of feeds. Basically, one is polling. Uh, something keeps polling, uh, I have another thing to invoke an action. The other one is a webhook. So this is how GitHub and then Slack all works. So I registered a webhook with my function, and then that gets called whenever something happens there. Okay. And persistent connection is what, uh, some servers, you have to start up a service, uh, which keeps running always. Uh, and then it kind of receives an event from the external event source. The moment it receives, it calls the REST API that goes and calls your function. Okay. So this is the uh, pictorial like, representation of how <coughs> the trigger will work. So something is running and then it calls your event and then it calls your function. All right. And that's all I have today. Okay, so you can just go here to the same demo and then you can just uh, run yourself to the demo to see how it actually works. What? Thank you.